Okay, everybody, we got Scott, we got Sean, we got Johnny, we got Mike Racine, and it is time for the the Mike Racine show. The Out for, <laughs> it is the Out for Smokes podcast. We're back. How are you guys? I'm good, man. How are you feeling? I'm great. Yeah. We have a uh, we have a beautiful story for you for you guys today. We have a story about uh, about revolution. About it's a story about discipline. It's a story about friendship. It's a story about neo colonialism. Um, it's a story about women's rights. That's right. um, it's a story about uh, Africa. We're finally doing it. We're finally diving in. We're reviewing the Lion King. Diving into. <laughs> yeah. We'll be reviewing the Lion King today. <laughs> we take a different look at the Lion King, and we we say, "Was Scar actually the good guy?" That's what Jordan Peterson does, which is very funny. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It's it's a lot of um, analyzing Pinocchio, mm-hmm. analyzing the Lion King. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you say about the Lion King? Well, I guess I think it's he, he really I. I so I wrote a joke like years ago about how Hakuna Matata has ruined my life because I always thought it was a good thing. You watch mm-hmm. the movie and you're a kid and your parents don't explain to you that Hakuna Matata is actually bad. Mm-hmm. In the story, yeah, you can have fun for a while, but then you got to go back home and take care of your shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought that was just like a silly observation. Yeah. And then there's a clip of Jordan Peterson where it's just like that's how that's what he teaches in college. Uh-huh. It's just like oh, yeah. you need to go home <laughs> and figure it the fuck out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, th- but they should have driven it more home about the the Hakuna Matata. Like like Timon and Pumbaa Simba should have been like watching pornography for like yeah, because his nine life hours a day. Because it's you don't yeah. see the terrible side of it. You don't. You see ju- the bad they side just go, "That's it, yeah. bad. You can't do this." And you yeah. go, "But why?" Like he yeah. doesn't get diarrhea from the bugs. You don't see any of the negative. <laughs> right. Hakuna Matata, you sign up for Tinder Plus and swipe for 10 hours. <laughs> yeah. Just gooning. Yeah. Podcasting is very Hakuna yeah. Matata. Yeah. This is... <laughs> Poma, come in here. I want to jack off one more time. <laughs> Timon, I think maybe you've, you've had enough. What do they call it now? Fucking, what's his face? Uh, Norman Finkelstein even said gooning, where it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you just is... masturbate like a maniac. That's the new thing. Oh. Yeah, it's different from edging, but you're just continuously masturbating for long periods. And you do you do you? Uh, I, I guess you can come. I think. Yeah. Can we say it in the first ten minutes of YouTube? I have no idea. It's we science. Can, right? This is can science. That's, yeah. medis- that's medical. <laughs> right. 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 But right. yeah, gooning is sort of, I guess, like you know, if a you were to hibernate, a but with masturbation, a matata. <laughs> 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 Timon and I just kind of <laughs> jack off all day. Come on, kid. I know you might not be old enough to get an erection, but you can hold mine. Come on, kid. Check out this new footage of AOC on C-SPAN. <laughs> yeah, Pumbaa tells gonna... the story about when he was younger, everyone would run away because he would fart. Mm-hmm. But the real, but they actually stop him from saying it. Yeah, right. But he wasn't going to say fart. We thought he was going to say fart because it rhymes with what he was going to say, yeah. but he was masturbate <laughs> in front of everyone. I got down yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. Every time that I, I masturbated, masturbated <laughs> at the lake. You see? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but uh, no, we aren't talking about the Lion King. We, we are uh, right. talking about... Uh, talking about something very serious. Real life Simba. Because in mm, real life, yeah. Simba gets killed by French imperialists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Thomas Sankara. Yeah. Yeah, and we've gotten a lot of requests to do an episode like this, and uh, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's going to be fun. We're jumping in. We're diving in. Yeah, we're diving into Africa. We don't know. We don't really know that much about. I about, didn't. Well, yeah, I, 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 I didn't know he existed. Uh, yeah. And then on Monday, someone was like, "Scott's got to uh, know about this guy." Yeah, and then di- I fell in love with him. He's so easy to fall in love with. Yeah, in our Discord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you can join if you sign up for patreoncom slash mm, smokes. patreoncom slash smokes. Five dollars a month gets you a, a bonus episode every week. That's right. Okay, so the three of us, we all watch this documentary. It's called Thomas Sankara, the Upright Man. Yeah. It's, did uh, you Did you watch it? Oh, I watched it. Yeah, yeah it's filmed by Robin Sheffield. <laughs> he uh, watched The Lion King by accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's on one you- and a half. Even Lion the third King, one. one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Thomas. Car the Upright Man. It's on YouTube, so we'll have a link to it in the description if you want to watch it. But I've just got some notes from it here, so yeah. we'll just kind of go through the story. Wait, have you seen Lion King 2, by the way? 
yeah, I think I like went pretty hard on caring about watching all. Like I was like, okay, if it's canon, yeah. I'll I care. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to know what happened to these characters because there's like a whole thing with like the the spawn. Like there's a, a Scar's heir. Yes, but they don't. And he looks like Scar, but they don't say who his father is. They don't say don't like know. this is Scar's son. Haven't so watched it wonder, in a long time. Anyway, there. I guess there was another lion that looked like Scar that was able to have sex with women lions, and. <laughs> And get uh, the, an evil lady lion pregnant and make... Yeah, anyway. I yeah. don't know. <clears throat> Thomas Sankara. We'll talk about that on the Patreon. <laughs> Thomas Sankara. <laughs> yeah. Sankara. Uh, he was the president of Burkina Faso from 1983 until his assassination in 1987. He's often called the African Che Guevara. I got a shirt on. Uh, he's got the red beret. It's a little cold in here. I'll, I can show you guys later. Uh, it's not that cold in here. Oh, I could take off. All right. What so is it? I'll a put, red I'll put, beret I'll, with, I'll put with my, I'll two take nipple my, points? I'll take my sweater off. <laughs> the, the nipples are cut out for, for his eyes. <laughs> Sean's got the perfect body for it. Sean's nipples are that close together. All right, yeah. yeah so this nice. is my Thomas Sankara shirt. Oh, that's a great shirt. Yeah, yeah. it's not a bad shirt. Yeah. yeah. Can show the guns off. Um, but anyways, uh, he was, uh, he's called the African Che Guevara, and he's got this very iconic red uh, beret. And it's interesting, you know, in Burkina Faso just last year, there was another military coup where another captain who's uh, very much inspired by uh, Thomas Sankara came to power. And uh, uh, he also re wears the same red beret. So it's, it is very much a symbol of like revolution and uh, a symbol of hope for oppressed peoples around the world, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, but yeah, Thomas Sankara was a fascinating man. He, uh, he, he took power when he was 33 years old, and he was dead assassinated when he was 37 years old. But in that time, in those about four years that he was in power, I mean, he really changed Burkina Faso fundamentally. And in fact, he changed the name of it. It was the French colony of Upper Volta, and he renamed it Burkina Faso, the land of upright Which men. Which means, yeah, the land of upright men. Yeah. So that's another theme we're going to get into today, just what it what it means to be an upright. Yeah. To be an upright and man. And the French were upset because it was obviously first a French name, and they saw upright men as an insult to their soft penis. They thought <laughs> they were implying that the French had soft penises. Yeah. And that it was it was a cock shame. They're like, how dare you? Sometimes we eat too much butter and we can't get an election. Yeah. yeah. They think Pan-Africanism <laughs> is about French people having <laughs> lame cock. <laughs> Um, but yeah, oh, the, uh, Pan seared Africanism or pan, I don't know, <laughs> something there. Oh, uh, uh, Sangara also did the national anthem. He was mm. a guitarist, oh. so he made the new national anthem as well. But, um, you know, just like a little bit of background here, just basic kind of, uh, uh, Cliff Notes version. Uh, Upper Volta was, a uh, part of the, one of the former French colonies of Western Africa, uh, at the start of the eighties. It got its independence in 1960, um, and uh, basically, the French colonized most of West Africa, all the way down south to what is uh, today the Republic of Congo, different from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But most all that area was um, uh, was French. And so, uh, as of uh, the start of the 1980s, uh, you know, around the time Sankara comes to power, uh, Upper Volta or Burkina Faso, it's got no access to the sea. It's got desert to the north. It was kind of seen as a source of cheap labor. So, like, the people would be invited to work at, in the Ivory Coast to the south. Um, and they really hadn't made any progress since um, independence in 1960. It was one of the uh, poorest countries on Earth at the time. Now, was there kind of a movement in the 1960s for a lot of these African countries to sort of become independent? Because JFK was very, like, into uh, African independence. Right, right, right. And, like, when dignitaries would visit the White House, they had trouble finding them hotels to stay at right yeah yeah because they'd be like oh we don't let you know we don't let them stay at our hotels and they'd be like no but it's not like it's not the people from like mississippi it's like the it's people from africa there's a it's very a different type of yeah there's an interesting book i'll confess i've only read half of called uh, betting on the africans and it's about jfk's africa policy basically and he was like a pro third world nationalist as long as they were anti-communist kind mm -hmm. of guy mm -hmm. so he got along decently with nasser and um in egypt mm. and uh you know you think I, jfk was ever like uh, hey brothers good to see you <laughs> you think you ever like code switched when they you know the... uh we were slaves too <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, but it was it was a pretty live movement in the 1960s, and uh, obviously Patrice Lumumba was infamously assassinated in the Congo just before JFK 
came to power, and then after um, after JFK was assassinated, Kwame Nkrumah was kind of another uh, person of the same, you know, nationalist, pro-African disposition. He was deposed in a CIA-backed coup under LBJ. So it's like this was a it was a live issue throughout the time. It was just you know CIA, French intelligence, Belgian intelligence. They all kind of had their finger in the pie, and they were making sure. And you know to an extent, as of course the KGB and stuff as well. But all the various imperialist powers have always, you know, since they were able to colonize Africa, never stopped being interested in Africa. And that's something that's uh, that was pretty interesting, uh, just doing the research on this, where kind of what the French did, and it was smart, but it was it was quite evil, where we say, you know, um, Burkina Faso gets its independence in 1960, and France gave a lot of their former colonies independence, but they set it up so that... Um, their uh, their former colonies, when they got independence, they were put in debt to France. And uh, the currency of most of these former colonies, uh, colonies were pegged to the French franc. Mm. And France would control their investments. And 50 to 60% of the budgets of these former colonies would be supported by France. Mm. So in all these ways, France kept their African colonies dependent, even after granting them you know, official independence in the 1960s or so. It depends on the colony. Mm. But that's what happened with Burkina Faso, where... It gets independence in 1960, but by the time Thomas Sankara takes power in 1983, it's just made really no progress whatsoever. It's right. still the same extremely dependent uh, country. It's right. extremely dependent on France. Right. But, you know, like uh, Sankara, he gives this speech where he talks about imperialism because people say, you know, what is imperialism? Where is the imperialism in, in Burkina Faso today? And he has this quote, just look into your plates. You'll see imported corn, rice, or millet. This is imperialism. And and he's right, where it's like Burkina Faso and just most of Africa was food independent for thousands of years. And then the Europeans came in, you know, with the scramble for Africa, and all of these formerly food independent places became food dependent. They started importing their corn and their wheat and their millet, and as soon as you need somebody to feed you, you are dependent on them. They have control over you. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, in Cambodia, for example, the Khmer Rouge, they took over the food supply as one of the first things. It's It all just makes perfect sense. And right. Tom Sankara was only in power for four years, but within three years, Burkina Faso achieved food independence. So it's a... Uh, but that was part of the plan to import the food? Yeah, I mean, you know, these things have various degrees of 12D chess thinking ahead, but it is something where control over the food supply is very much an efficient way to control a population. Mm. Make sure they have to kind of bend to your will. Sure. Um, but yeah, so the documentary is Thomas Sankara, The Upright Man, and we can just kind of go through his life in mostly chronological order and talk about a bit what a, a bit about what he did. Yeah. Yeah, there was some guy in the documentary that was like, uh, you know, I told him that uh, I thought the Red Beret was a little, I forget the word he used, but he says like corny or something like that. It was a little or, gay. It was a little, no, it was, it was like a little too much. Yeah. The, 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 the military imagery. But he was like, yeah, but we, we love it. Yeah. Yeah, he did this. What I like about him so much is in order to even control a country, you do have to have the military behind you, right? And so you have to change the thinking of the military. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to be a part of the community and they need to help out and they need to care for everybody and uh, be uh, just a part of your daily life, but not in like an infringing on your rights way in a, oh my God, it's so nice to see you way. I, I want to be one one day, not in like a, mm -hmm. they're good people and we want to be good people. Right. Um, and he believed in that. And it turns out it just is very easy to manipulate a guy who believes, the, not manipulate, but fuck over a guy who believes that because um, there's guys in the military who want nothing but power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sankara, uh, Sankara was ultimately betrayed and killed by his former best friend and his number two in command, Blaise Campare, who, uh, after he killed Sankara, was president of Burkina Faso until 2014. Yeah. Um, you know what's funny about that? Like, he, uh, he got warnings that the guy was going to betray him. Yeah. And he was like, no, because one of his military captains was like, we think he's plotting your assassination. He was like, no, I can't betray my friendship <laughs> yeah it's it's for him to betray but i friendship is not something to be betrayed and that like led to his death yeah he quotes him as saying yeah no friendship cannot be betrayed because this captain is trying to get him to arrest this this traitor who would ultimately kill him and he said no friendship cannot be betrayed yeah 
Yeah. No, the, he's um, fucking your wife, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it's straight up. I mean, it's it's like a Jesus story. It's knowing you're gonna die for doing what you're doing, and then just accepting it because in order to not die, what you're gonna kill your friend or right. Uh, yeah, being morally right, even though it, it means your death. But then sometimes it's like, I mean, we did that Charles de Gaulle episode, and the, the takeaway of that is that you do have to kill your enemies, right? I guess so, so yeah. It's, well, it's but, like a weird... Well, what's interesting about it, and the one thing I was like, oh, because I watched a bunch of different documentaries about it, and everyone was saying that he didn't know he was going to die, except the one documentary we watched, mm. uh, where that friend said he knew he was going to die. Oh, really? It was, he knew he was going to be overthrown, but ev like the four coups before him, or the mm. five coups before him, him, uh, they were all like quote unquote peaceful where it was like you know they forced them to sign a deal and the guy bows down and then like takes you know memberships elsewhere he's not like completely even punished mm -hmm. and so he was just like ah oh, fuck I guess you know they got me and they massacred this man yeah yeah I saw an interview with his wife that said she said he knew he was like in danger yeah. mm -hmm. which uh, yeah it's a bummer yeah, his wife blames the French for his assassination, but we'll get to all that. Um, but that's such a hard choice to make. Like, do I live or do I jail my friend? You yeah. Know? I mean, not for me. If it was me or you two. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> do I split you the would. podcast money three ways <laughs> or do I jail my friend? But at that point, there's also what, what we can just he see do? Sean, we just, just see Sean like, dry, wearing like a fur coat. <laughs> and we're like, oh, no. <laughs> He's playing. He walks into the room where he kills us. And he's wearing a big hat. He's wearing alligator shoes. Yeah. All right. Thomas Sankara. He was born in 1949. His father was a functionary in the French colonial government. He was a military policeman. So he uh, Sankara grew up in relative privilege. He joins the military uh, around this time in military academy. He meets a professor who um, uh, thinks he's cool, and it, it teaches him about the history of imperialism, the Chinese Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. He starts to get a political education. He reads the works of Marx and Lenin. Uh, he has a distinguished military career. He fights in this border war between Upper Volta, in Burkina Faso, and Mali in 1974. Um, he he kind of distinguishes himself in the fighting, which he later renounces as, quote, useless and unjust. But importantly, because he's, you know, a distinguished soldier and, and military officer, he becomes the, in 1976, he becomes the head of the commando training center. And he meets this fellow military officer who will become his best friend, who will plot the coup that will put him in power and then ultimately kill and betray him, Blaise Compare. He meets him in 1976. Um, Sankara is appointed the Minister of Information in 1981. There's several military coups in this period, so it kind of goes back and forth. But then Sankara is appointed Prime Minister in January 1983, dismissed four, month, four months later and arrested. Blaise Campari, after uh, his friend is arrested, Blaise Campari organizes the other officers and they do another military coup in August 1983. And this one puts Thomas Sankara in power. So Campari organized the coup, but he he was like, Sankara has to be the, the leader. Yeah, because uh, the documentary says that uh, Campara, uh, Campari had the more of the organizational kind of talents, but mm -hmm. Sankara was much more charismatic, much mm -hmm. more, you know, beloved by people. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, when Campari was overthrown in 2014, a lot of um, people in the streets we were wearing Sankara shirts. You know, mm -hmm. there was mass protest that eventually drove him from office and forced him to flee the country. And a lot of those people were, you know, they were wearing shirts. They weren't even alive when Sankara was, was assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, but so Sankara comes to power. Food self-sufficiency is the number one priority. I mentioned that uh, speech of, like, what is imperialism? It's the fact that all the corn and rice and millet in your, in your plate is imported. Country does become food self-sufficient within three years. And it's, it's pretty fascinating. Like, uh, the documentary interviews a, a U.N. official who was there, and he says uh, 1,700 kilograms of wheat per hectare was the average for the Sahel region, Sahel region, um, which is uh, the region in Africa that's um, below the Sahara Desert but above the Sudanese savanna, uh, which is uh, Burkina Faso falls into that. So 1,700 kilograms of wheat per hectare is the average. By 1986, Burkina Faso was producing 3,800 kilograms of wheat per hectare. So that's, you know, more than double. Um, <clears throat> uh, agrarian reform, uh, which meant a transfer of property, was a big part of that. So, like, the people who were big landholders, they had some of their land split off and given other people, which is, like, again, throughout history, going back to the Gracchi brothers in Rome, this is the kind of shit that gets you killed. Okay. 
uh, traditional landholders losing their power, not receiving taxes anymore. But, you know, besides just agrarian reform and splitting up the land, they also had a lot of government programs for irrigation and fertilization. Who owned the land, though? Was it, was it Africans or was it more uh, French people? That's a good question. It's, it was definitely a mix at this point because um, mainly what France did with independence, as we mentioned, was they had various people who were Africans, but they were puppets, you know, like... Uh, uh, Felix Hempho Boyer was president of the Ivory Coast mm. uh, from 1960 until his death in 1993. And he was uh, definitely part of the conspiracy that had Sankara murdered. But he was a guy who was set up by the French, who was like, yeah, a, a, a native, of course, but they just find local compadres who are whirling, or compradors, who are willing to, to work with them and kind of sell out the vast majority of their people in exchange for, hey, you get to live the high life. You can even be a millionaire, billionaire, whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as you're willing to sell out the vast majority of your people, we can still get a, a much better deal on your raw resources, on their labor, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but yeah, so he f achieves food self-sufficiency within three years. Uh, he... Uh, one of his first moves is to reduce the salaries of ministers and public servants, including his own. He sells the government fleet of Mercedes. He replaces them with the Renault 5, which is a French car. It was the cheapest car sold in Burkina Faso at the time. So nobody drive, none of, no government official drives Mercedes anymore. They drive the, the cheapest car, the Renault 5. Uh, nobody flies, no government official flies first class anymore. They fly economy. Um, and then, you know, I guess the anarchists would be mad because he just banned unions and opposition parties and right. <laughs> basically outlawed everyone who was opposed to him. Yeah. And, and now what is that? Because th the way I saw it explained is sort of you can't get anything done <laughs> initially if you don't ban things at first. <laughs> and it feels like some of these guys' promises when, when they do take over is like, hey, this isn't what it's always going to be. Mm. It's just currently we need to set this up. And then we'll get to having elections and whatnot, but like yeah. right now, y'all gotta chill. It definitely seemed like because even the current leader, he's like, "I'm not gonna be here forever. We'll do elections, but right now, no one gets to decide shit but me." Right? And you go, oh, I mean, things are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you do have to swing the hammer down. It though, sucks. I they, guess. I, it yeah. sounds so weird to say. I don't know. No, they but, but I think there's like it is. It's easier to look at a place like that where it was like a ten there was an percent urgency. literacy rating. It's like yeah. there's an urgency. Anyone needs to. You know, nothing is working. Yeah, and so it seems you know people would be I mean, more if also somebody, into change. If somebody, you know? if there was like a, a some young Muslim guy who who cut Joe Biden's head off and was like, we have to stop the, the Gaza thing. You and 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 we have to ban. And by the way, your wife has to wear a burqa. Yeah. <laughs> and be like, all right, fine. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but yeah, I th but that's like an interesting <laughs> point. But I think sometimes there is sort of like an urgency to what you're. No, yeah, doing. No, I, I agree. And, uh, it's yeah, weird. people were like starving. You know. Yeah. But yeah, but then your enemies are gonna say that it's it's bad. I don't know who really decides what's what's good and what's bad. You know, folks. Th that's the other thing I saw where it's like in order to you know, get this independence and to like build up, mm. you almost need to have a conscious uncoupling with your oppressor. Like yeah. you need to have France slowly um, stop giving you aid and slowly, and that's what they were kind of doing. Mm -hmm. um, I read the CIA documents and um, about it, which mm. it's like, what do, they're gonna lie anyway. But they were saying that, you know, slowly France was like removing money. And then by the point where he's assassinated, it's like the US and France are like, almost giving nothing and it's uh, it's about to work mm -hmm. and now this guy's assassinated and you're like well that seems very obvious you know yeah like the moment he finally is free to go you're gonna cut you know yeah cut his head off yeah, yeah the statistic is french economic aid reduced 80 percent between 1983 and 1985 it's crazy so then 85 and then he's assassinated in 87 yeah so it's like yeah it was only getting lower and then right when it's about to be done mm-hmm Right when you're about to stop getting pussy from <laughs> from this girl you made a disgusting deal with, uh -huh. um, she you, kills you. you? Kill her. Is that the you? Kill no, her? you kill. You know, oh, okay. You know, they're yeah. stealing pussy from someone. Right. <laughs> Beautiful Birkin Faso right. pussy. Yeah. He sets up also the pioneers movement uh, or the pioneers of the revolution. The youth under age twelve are given a political and ideological education. They're trained to be like selfless and altruistic to fight against imperialism. And it's kind of interesting where it's like all this stuff like banning opposition parties, setting up a pioneers movement or pioneers of the revolution. I think. <clears throat> 
I mean, a lot of the stuff wasn't popular with like uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the middle class and more educated people, I guess. Right. Well, it's just interesting to me because I think people will look at this kind of stuff and they always make, you know, the Hitler and Stalin analogy and they mm. say, you know, all this kind of stuff is the same, you know, authoritarian control, indoctrination of the youth, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, actually. It's you can do it for good and you can do it for right. evil. Right. Like when there's a country that's we just haven't seen anyone do it for good in a long time. Yes. Yeah. Except this dude, and that's what's kinda cool to look at him. I mean, as far as what I've seen, it seems like it was for the good. Right. I mean, when there's a country that is, you know, thirteen percent literacy, which he brings to seventy three percent in four years. It's mm -hmm. fucking insane. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, you know, and uh it's totally dependent on France, poverty, there's no rail line, there's no housing, it builds all sorts of houses. I mean, it's like like, honestly, I'm totally fine with people using authoritarian methods to achieve good results. Yeah. I know it's not popular to say as an American, and I love free speech. I love all the, you know, I love our fake opposition parties. I love my two-party system where it doesn't matter which one I vote for. They're both going to send Israel more bombs mm -hmm. with my money and, you know, suck Zionist cock in public. And you can just, there's no vote you can make that will help the people of Gaza. Mm. But as much as I do love all that, I'm like, yeah, ultimately, if you're going to use authoritarian methods, they're not inherently bad if you achieve results that are beneficial for the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. It's very different, you know, from Nazism, from mass extermination and expulsion and, and all that and war and, and everything else to just say, yeah, no, we're not going to have a debate about this. We're going to feed the people, and we're going to give them health care, and we're going to build them houses, and we're going to educate them. That is a good thing, and I'm not going to pretend it's not. You know, and it's like, obviously, of course, Sankara, even the documentary acknowledges there are plenty of excesses and things that were, you know, done wrong. But overall, I mean, the record in four years is incredible. Mm -hmm. Are you upset that he gave women some more rights? <laughs> yeah, that, that bothered me. I didn't like. I didn't like when he didn't put it to a vote that uh, he banned female genital mutilation. Yeah, should have allowed more debate on that. Yeah, but that that is the a good thing. You I know, mean, the like, Brooklyn people they probably hate him because he banned polygamy. Right, and that's oh, yeah. he banned. <laughs> he made polyamory uh, a death sentence. Oh yeah, it's actually fine to have. Uh... <laughs> Wait, was it a death sentence? No, were these things? No, I mean, no, right? Okay, yeah. He actually didn't kill that many people. There were some executions, yeah. some summary mm. executions of former government officials, but it's like mm. France actually started, uh, uh, within France, they started, the government started a public relations campaign to educate the French people, to convince them that Sankara was bad, to try to like play up all these atrocities and stuff. Sure. And it's like, yeah, there were abuses of power, but there really weren't that many executions. Yeah. You got to break some eggs, right? Yeah. Well, there was that video that came out this week where the guy was saying that some guy was saying that like this country needs a dictator and that's why he's voting for Trump. <laughs> and it's it's kind of like we are all kind of the same. Well, that's what you know. Everybody's you know? everybody's looking for the American Caesar. Yeah, and that's what Caesar did. He came right. into Rome and he right. just did land reform. He forgave a bunch of debts and right. like blah blah blah. He was a dictator, but the right. people there loved him. Yeah. Because he actually did things. When you yeah, live, right. We've lived in America, which has been stagnant and doing nothing. And right. all of these problems over the last 40 years, ever since you know Reaganism or whatever, mm -hmm. they've just gotten worse. Mm -hmm. This is more drug addicts than ever. Yeah. So it's like, I think... We want to see someone flex the muscle a We want to just see people do something. And it's yeah. you know not like Trump will, but you understand why a lot of people in America are like, yeah, I don't care if somebody's a fucking dictator. If they fix yeah. the problems, right. then yeah, right. sure, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. He's also not a dictator, right? I mean, he's just a jerk. <laughs> like he's not going to be a dictator, you know? Yeah, I don't think so. No, of course not. He's too. Uh, They're trying to make us feel too, like, he's, like gonna be. he's too like secure. Yeah, like even when he was like, yeah. "I'll be a dictator on day one," it's like what he's saying is he's gonna get in trouble. All the people that deserve to be in trouble. Like I know it sounds <laughs> bad, but we're talking about bad people. He's gonna right? throw the bad people in. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like yeah, I know he's bad too. Oh, this all sucks. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Sankara is putting me in prison for <laughs> being polyamorous. <laughs> Here's the thing, I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine to uh, be dirty and <laughs> am I, have sex with different women. Am I going to be out by like seven because I got a DoorDash job? <laughs> mm. I got to get so, this chicken pad thai. So inside. Over to in Ivory Coast. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, but so yeah, Sankara, he banned female genital mutilation, he banned forced marriage, banned polygamy. So so if you if you have the power to like end female genital mutilation, you should use it. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to, when you're the guy who all the girls want to fuck. <laughs> <You know? laughs> to mean? give women rights. It's like, hey, you don't or you aren't forced to marry anybody and then all the girls want to fuck him. He's the one they want to have sex with. You yeah. Know? That's not fair. Yeah, but you're saying that he no, already just a was. Bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. The men's rights case against Thomas Sankara. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, He's uh, so right. Yeah. But he was the first African head of state to appoint women to uh, positions in uh, head of government positions in ministries other than like Minister of Women's Affairs. Yeah, he gave him guns. Yeah, he brought him into the military, brought him into politics. Uh, you know, gen- and this is a traditional society where, you know, as we mentioned, you know, men being all powerful over the family, uh, schools had expelled girls for being pregnant. He ended that. Mm. Uh, he brought a lot of women into the workforce. Uh, and, you know, it, so. Yeah, it was extremely progressive, and, you know, it's the 1980s, but he was still ahead of the ball on that. Yeah. He was like, if you're a guy, you can get a bunch of girls pregnant, and they get punished. Right. You can just keep getting girls pregnant, and you get to stay in school. Yeah, he's like, you get to go to and school. And walk at graduation. You get to bring your little skateboard to graduation, even though you've got 13 girls kicked <laughs> out of school. <laughs> now, does that make any... You, you also a had a... Simpson. Uh, What's that? I don't know. You brought up a skateboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> Barte Simpson. <Yeah. laughs> and we are going to execute Barte Simpson. Barte Simpson. Um, and then, uh, and then he had like a wo- a women's day, right? Yeah. Where, where where men would stay home. They would go to the market to see what it would be like mm-hmm. to be a woman. Yeah. No, it's they like... They were like, yeah, this isn't that bad. Yeah. They actually complain too much. <laughs> they tuck their wieners. Sexism <laughs> rises you have to 80%. Your, you have to tuck your wiener in all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. He's a feeding and housing. We mentioned feeding, housing, and giving people health care were his priorities. He launches a vaccination campaign to eliminate measles, polio, and meningitis. 2.5 million people vaccinated in 1983 to 1985. Do you feel like when you look at history, it's kind of rare that people are that into women's, uh, women's rights, women's issues? You don't see it that much. Well, especially because he didn't have to, I guess, is part of it. But yeah. because if you look at his plan, and I think the reason it was working so well, is he, he wasn't ignorant to the bullshit. And it's like, this is someone who could be a productive member of society. Mm-hmm. Our ignorance is preventing us from pushing forward. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, knocked it out of the park with all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty rare. But no, yeah, Scott's right. He institutes mass sporting activities. Each inhabitant invited to practice a sport once a week. Because mm-hmm. there is this idea with the left is that, you know, like we're we're doughy and we, uh, you know, we can't play Soft, sports. can't fight. Yeah, we can't hold a job. We can't, we don't we understand markets. We weigh a buck markets. 10 soaking wet. We weigh 110 pounds soaking wet. But he was like, uh, no, people should play sports and join the military. Yeah, he's like recreational you know. soccer. And they're like, for, it's forced labor. I found mm-hmm. his yeah. entire attitude. It was on- actually forced labor to make me play soccer. <laughs> so <laughs> Thomas jog on, a, <laughs> on a track. <laughs> Thomas Sankara is like a dictator. He says I can only have sex with one Bushwick art hoe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like some of us don't like to exercise. And it's, it's actually capitalism. <laughs> no, it's not. Get on the fucking treadmill, bitch. I, you know, uh, Sanger had like <laughs> such a such a fascinating view of the military because, of course, he came through the military, and you know, this is um, uh, something I do believe, and you do see this in various societies. Like, of course, oh, now he's going to outlaw eating your own cum. <laughs> <laughs> We're a starving nation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope anybody gets it. No, they will. They know who we're. Um, but no, I, I always found a, a Sankara. I saw what you said about me on Twitter. <laughs> He's gonna block me on my other, alt, yeah. my other alt. My other other alt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sankara is fascinating because it's like he had a very, very smart view of the military. Because of course he came mm-hmm. through the military, and you know, if you look at these various uh, revolutionary figures throughout history, a lot of them did come from the former colonial militaries. Because uh-huh. that was like one of the only ways, if you were a colonized, subjugated people, mm-hmm. one of the only ways you could kind of rise in the ranks and gain access to power. Yeah. And Sankara talks about uh, 
a soldier without political training is a potential criminal. Right. Because they can just go kill whoever and they have no idea why. They're just following orders. Right, right. So he talks a lot about having military discipline with ideological and political training and education. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's just like... He also said it was illegal to have sex with women with Down syndrome. <laughs> and some people really didn't like that one, folks. <laughs> Um, Yeah, but that's like something that's really interesting about him is he was very big on education. Yeah. And I don't know. Education is important. I feel like now in my 30s, I'm finally getting the education that I should have got when I was like in high school. Yeah. And um, like I didn't know anything until a few years ago. I didn't know anything about any of this, any of this stuff. Colonialism. No, it's uh, Africa. It's a lifelong process. <laughs> the eating, CIA eating your own cum. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I didn't even know people could do that on on camera. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So in ni- the nineteen eighties, Africa is emerging from one of the deadliest droughts in its history. Um, Sankara he fights desertification by he organizes the planting of over ten million trees, which is the first such program on the continent. Uh, he has the One Village, One Grove project. Every village is encouraged to plant and maintain a grove. And these are all like very like ahead of their time environmental ideas that you know greatly benefited the people of uh, Burkina Faso. We mentioned he launches this public housing uh, building program. Like he sets up brick factories within Burkina Faso. They build like real houses for people who are living in shacks mm-hmm. or like if even that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this vast road and rail building program. He builds the first domestic rail ro- line. He connects all regions of the country and is built with citizen labor since no foreign money was available. As we mm-hmm. mentioned, you know, the French cut their aid by like 80%. Were they volunteering? Or were uh, they getting paid? I guess they would have to pay them, but they would probably, yeah, I, I don't know the exact details. Yeah. But it's like, okay, if he conscripted people into it, like, that's fine. I yeah. don't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you use what you have. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> And, and, you know, it is just something where we get in all these arguments about capitalism, communism, socialism, but what this is is called state-led development. And from my reading, I'm not an expert, but it almost always works. It's not perfect, but when you utilize the state and you say, hey, these are vital goods that people need, such as housing, education, transportation, we're going to use the power of the state to make sure they happen and cut the obstacles out of the way, people benefit. And, you know, millions of people benefit. Mm. Anyways, <clears throat> and he encouraged the buying and using of goods that were produced locally. Like uh, every public servant had to consume local products. They had to wear clothes that were made with local cotton, dyed by local craftsmen, woven and sewn by local craftsmen, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd set up these kind of state-owned enterprises or just like make sure that people had to patronize local enterprises yeah. as opposed to uh, being dependent on foreign sources. So that was really interesting to me because there's this idea that like that like buying local or whatever or like not consuming certain brands or materials or whatever is like this sort of like hips this annoying, you know, hipster ideology. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Where it's like uh, where, where actually you, what you're supposed to do. If yeah, like yeah. if you do that you're annoying, but if you're actually educated as to like where the stuff you're buying is coming from or how it's produced or who or you're, that, yeah. who who it's benefiting. The government is killing you <laughs> with the yeah. food that they give you. Right. Yeah. Right. No, literally like I I fed my family Red Baron pizza for dinner tonight because it was there was two for eight at the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like just putting a gun in Ben's mouth. Well, I'm, yeah, I know, I know, but there's some nights. I mean, I had to be here at six to do the to no, do the pot. But um, but that's that that can be characterized as like annoying if you're. But but I think it's I think it's good. I think it's a positive thing. I think it's good to be to be educated and to consume. Ethically, no, I think if you if you whatever can, you should is. grow some of your own food. If you have the opportunity to, everybody should. Yeah. It's amazing to do. I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> you know. You but, wouldn't uh, grow your own tomatoes? Hmm? You would grow your own tomatoes. You would love that. Um I I would I just don't know yeah. where I would do oh, it. I don't have the space. Maybe in my window on my fire escape. Yeah. yeah. Just stopping of Yeah, they uh, have these new like uh th- things for cities, you know, where it's like a little box that you can actually grow a bunch of things in and uh-huh. pour water into like a plastic dirt cup it's probably really you'll probably get cancer from <clears throat> eating whatever grows from it but yeah 
I guess there's this idea that like when people go like, oh, your shirt's made by slaves, people roll their eyes and go, oh, really? Yeah. But it's like, yeah. what else am I supposed to do? Mm. But there's nothing you should you should have an idea of what you're. And also, I think people like to participate in stuff. Yeah. 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 If you. But I think sometimes capitalism will sort of like it isolates you. For sure. It stops you from making money. And then and then when you object to the the the, the shitty cheap goods they go, oh, well, poor people actually need those things. Yeah. So, like, it doesn't pay you enough at your job. It forces you to eat McDonald's, and then it 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 demonizes the people who speak out against eating at McDonald's. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't mention him by yeah, name. Well, no, it could have been anybody. I think it's fine. It could be, but anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, 1980, or, uh, Sankara sets up the People's Revolutionary Tribunals. These were created in 1983. They had some members of the former government executed. Um, but the guilty, I thought it was interesting what he did. The guilty have to justify themselves in public on radio and television. Mm-hmm. So he kind of used like public shaming. Mm-hmm. Like for the most part, the sentences actually weren't that harsh. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was like for a big part of it was public shaming. So it's like if you were a corrupt official, you had to explain why you did what you did, why you stole from the people, blah blah mm-hmm. blah. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you know, we should do an episode of that. We should look at the show account and and make sure I've been <laughs> using all the funds properly. <laughs> make me justify every dollar from the from the out for smokes checking account. <laughs> Ooh. <clears throat> Yeah, this uh, this purchase for Bella Hadid bathwater microscene. <laughs> that does that advance the show's interest? Well, she's Palestinian. <laughs> um, anyways, but you know, so towards the end of his reign, people would, some people would say the the tribunals would kind of be used to settle scores. Some quote unquote lazy workers would be singled out and mm. uh, made to work for free. Yeah. And that kind of stuff. And a similar thing happened with the revolutionary defense committees. These are set up, you know, uh, they were set up in Cuba, but these are like these people's tribunals, these revolutionary defense committees. These are ways of setting up kind of citizen courts, citizens, police, police forces in order to defend the revolution. But these things are always, um, they are always subject to abuse, so they do have to be carefully watched. And and Sankara even talked about, you know, he implemented a curfew, and uh, he gives this speech about how some guys would, like, go over to a woman's house they were interested in, and they would see it's 10 minutes to curfew, and they would make another guy leave or something like that, you know. And so, uh, but so, yeah, there's, like, there, there certainly were abuses, but it is just kind of interesting to see how this all played out like towards the end of his reign part of why he was killed was there was a factional split within his government like the people loved him um though you know some of the middle classes were a little more sick of him by the end and and uh what what eventually happens like but let the poor people have a turn it's you know controlling the levers for a little bit well, some teachers within Burkina Faso organized a strike against the tribunals. And we mentioned, you know, this the rise in literacy is insane. Mm-hmm. 13% in 1983, 73% in 1987 mm-hmm. when, he's, when he's assassinated. So the teachers yeah. are like, we should be millionaires. <laughs> we taught <laughs> right. so many people We taught three million people how to read. Time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, imagine teaching like a 47-year-old how to read. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's weird. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, because when you're six and you learn how to read, you do it with like flashcards. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, the cat <laughs> sounded out. Like, like you're sitting with a 64 year old guy and you're reading like Brown Bear, what do you see? Um, My kid can read that book, by the way. Hell yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That's sick. Um, <clears throat> okay. uh, some teachers organize a strike within Burkina Faso against the tribunals. Um, Sankara, uh, he actually fires like 1,200 to 1,400 teachers, mm. primary school teachers, for striking, mm. he ha- uh, which is like there weren't that many teachers. So, you know, he was a really uncompromising guy, which probably did him yeah. in, in the end. Right. Um, but so they have to replace these teachers with revolutionary teachers on like 10 days training. The results are disastrous. So unfortunately, like things are kind of starting to go south by the end. Um <clears throat> Uh, but uh, kind of what really does, probably what does Sankara in, we don't know for sure, 
but probably why he is ultimately assassinated is he goes to the um, Organization of African Unity in 1987. It's since been um, replaced. In 2002, they found it the African Union, and that's uh, kind of taken over for the Organization of African Unity. Uh, but this is a, a forum where various the various nations of Africa meet, and it's supposed to be, you know, kind of get on the same page and all that. For the most part throughout its history, you know, they haven't been able to stay on the same page. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that is imperial interference and, and such, but, you know, there are divergent interests. But he actually goes to the Organization of a African Unity in 1987, Sankara does, and he gives this speech, and he advocates every African nation just stop paying their debt. That's you know, awesome. Which is a great idea. Yeah. Like, you know, to the Europeans, to the Americans, Russians, Chinese, whoever. Just say, a lot of these places, right, they would like, they would get their independence, but yeah, like you said, they'd still be in debt yeah. to whatever colonial power, which I don't, I don't know how you work that out. But it's like, it's essentially just saying fuck you to these people. Yeah. Everybody's saying fuck you. And he even says in the speech, he says... Uh, it's like if everybody went to Whole Foods with a tote bag. And <laughs> yeah, it's like and we just don't have to go back to that library. We don't like, have to pay the fine. The, the two We're security fine. guards would not be able to stop us if we all went together, let's say, Saturday morning, go on as Whole Foods. Yeah. <laughs> 12 10 a.m. 12 10 p.m. Yeah. yeah, if we said cheese crackers at Whole Foods are free yeah. tomorrow, if yeah. the whole nation decided that, if everybody they can't knew stop that. Us, yeah. That string cheese is free tomorrow. <laughs> hey, save some for me. National take string <laughs> hey, cheese day. Uh, I'll be taking the string cheese. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can have whatever else. Uh, Tilap tilapia. <clears throat> But yeah, so in Sankara's speech to the Organization of African Unity, he, I'm paraphrasing him, but he says, if I, if Burkina Faso, if, if I alone stop paying the debt, I won't be here next year. I will be assassinated. Or like, he doesn't say assassinated, but he says, I won't be here last year. And there's like a knowing laugh in the hall because mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, they'll fucking kill you. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, if all of us together stop paying the debt, mm -hmm. like we could change the world and mm -hmm. we could, you know... And he very much advocated, you know, building production within Africa, not importing, you know, th these sorts of things. And it's like, yeah, that's a very, it's a very dangerous way to start talking because you're very much threatening the entire world system of, mm -hmm. you know, neocolonialism or whatever the fuck you want to call it. That's the tough uh, thing about big change, though, right? You need, like, everybody on board. You need everybody to work together yeah. to kind of, uh, it's like a prisoner's dilemma or whatever. You have to... You have to make sure nobody kind of sells you out to the French. Everybody has to say, hey, we'll all trust that we're all going to not become rats, you know, because there might be like a little bit of temporary advantage for us if we become rats, if we, you know, betray the cause, whatever. But if we all work together, the benefits are longer term. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, he is assassinated very shortly after. Uh, he's assassinated October 1987. He gives this speech uh, to the Organization of African Unity in July 1987. And I mentioned the president of the Ivory Coast, uh, Félix Humphoy Bounier. Uh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he was president from independence in 1960 to his death in 1993, uh, and he worked with France against Sankara. And he was very much threatened by his own people started supporting these revolutionary ideas. That was the other thing. Like, So I was yeah. like five months old when he was assassinated. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I wish my cunt boomer parents, you, imperialist fucks, educated me about that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing, mom and dad, you pigs. <laughs> you boomer pigs. Um, yeah, we mentioned in the Ivory Coast, um, a lot of the poor people in Burkina Faso went south there to, to work for cheap labor. So uh, Felix Humphoy Bounier, he hated that he was losing his cheap labor because these people were getting rich, or not rich, but at least their standard of living was improving. So that's why he hated Sankara. But he was also like a lot of um, heads of state in Africa at the time, especially those who were uh, puppets of the French or puppets of whoever. Um, they didn't like that their people were getting all these revolutionary ideas. You know, their people were getting the wrong ideas for, from Thomas Sankara. So uh, Felix Humphoy Bonnier, president of the Ivory Coast, he works as the contact person for Blaise Compare, who was, as we mentioned, Sankara's number two, his best friend, the man who organized the coup that put him in power. And he would ultimately, he maintained control over the army, and he would ultimately be the guy who uh, had him assassinated. <laughs> and as we mentioned, Sankara had been warned, but he refused to act. And uh, what happened is October 15, 1987, Blaise Compare's personal guard, they rush in to, uh, uh, to Sankara's presidential palace uh, during a meeting. They open fire and they kill him along with 12 other officials. 
They just, you know, spray machine guns everywhere. Mm. Uh, they bury him in an unmarked grave. Yeah, I heard they chopped up his body. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. They only just, it wasn't until Blaise Campare was uh, overthrown in 2014 that they finally were able to exhume Sankara's body because he would never allow that. Before. Yeah, and, what's, and so it, it was like clear that obviously he was shot up and then chopped up. Mm-hmm. Mm. But yeah, the part of the reason he wasn't arrested is because, what is it when you die? What is that called? I'm forgetting the name of the paper. Death certificate. Yeah. It's just natural causes, it says. That's how he died, uh, which is very odd that paperwork that other countries would see is all that matters you know like oh no look it says that's what happened so the french don't have to say shit you know yeah oh they sent us this letter yeah his death certificate says vaccine injury on it (laughs) (laughs) um so blaze campare the next day after he kind of justified it by saying that he thought sankara was coming after him that's what he says in public yeah blaze campare appoints himself president next day claims sankara plan to purge against him. He institutes a, quote, rectification of the revolution. And uh, Burkina Faso, he, he undoes a lot of the nationalizations that Sankara implemented. You know, a lot of the private businesses that became government businesses are now sold back to the private sector. He overturned a lot of Sankara's policies. He rejoined the International Monetary Fund. He rejoined the World Bank. Uh, he, you know, kind of turns the foreign aid tap back on. Um, and, you know, uh, Ivory Coast and France are thrilled. Like, Relations had kind of sunk to the bottom of the barrel with both countries, but now both countries are uh, back on board because he essentially undoes most of what Sankara did. Yeah. Was it called the Ivory Coast because they killed all the, uh, a bunch of elephants? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> I think it's trade, right? Because it's where they would trade ivory? Yeah, I mean, yes. yes Things yes, of that, that sort? That was uh, when we did the episode of Belgium and the Congo. Uh, the original European interest in Africa was ivory. And yeah. later, with the invention of, you know, the the rubber tire for the bicycle and such, yeah. later they became interested in rubber. But initially, they were most interested in ivory. Does it feel like Western imperialism is always much shittier to Africa than it is to other places? Yeah, and, you know, it is fascinating where it's like um, there's so much less coverage of it. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, Paul Kagame... Uh, Could that be racism? Well, yeah. But it's like, you know, millions of people were killed in Africa in wars in the 90s. And a lot of that, there is evidence that this was backed by, you know, CIA and French intelligence and stuff. And it's just like, these are horrific atrocities. And you have to really go out of your way to learn about them in the English Really go out of your way. Like, you have to make an actual effort. Well, because it it the, the it looks like they're all just killing each other for some exactly reason. yeah and you know and that's something I did want to mention on this episode is there's really been a resurgence in this kind of what's called now human biodiversity it used mm-hmm. to be called eugenics but now it's kind of come back on the right human biodiversity and this is the idea that the differences in populations are explained racially mm-hmm. why is Africa poor because Africans are you know lower IQ blah 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 and it's like this is Wait, that's not that's not what you believe. That's not what I believe, but I'm saying this is making a comeback in the United States. You have to and right. Europe. You have right. to accept that this is a real school of thought. You know, Steve Saylor, yeah. Bronze Age pervert. These are people who actually believe and advocate this. And these are not fringe people. They are becoming more and more, let's say, powerful within the right wing of uh, American and European politics. Mm. So you do have to have an actual answer for all this. And yeah. when you look at a guy like Thomas Sankara, what you learn is like People aren't really that different. Like, I'm not a, you know, I accept there are probably some racial differences, but I don't think they are that relevant. Like, I think they are extremely minor if they do exist. Like, okay, you know. Or they're just cultural things. Well, there are cultural things, but it's like, okay, yes, genetically, black people are more prone to sickle cell anemia. Like, that's just a fact. Nobody denies that. Mm -hmm. But the differences you observe between. But you're also good at stuff. (laughs) The differences you observe between Africa and Europe and America are explained perfectly well by this kind of colonial exploitation model. And the thing is, as we kind of, um, if we want to keep imperialism going, if we want to keep the system of exploitation going, you do need, you do need some sort of explanation that says this is not actually imperialism, this is not exploitation. So these human biodiversity theories, they do serve a purpose for these imperial colonial right, right, powers. Right, right. And it's it's just something where it's like, it's so important to educate people about the real history of these places. Yeah. Because again, if you are just somebody who doesn't know that much and you look at the news and you see violence where there's brown people, yeah. 
you can draw the conclusion yeah. that brown people are somehow different. Brown people can't do this or that. And it's just... I guess it's also much more convenient to believe that stuff. Too. Yeah. Because sure. if, if it's not, you know, it then, then that means that you have to face some real horrible shit. Yeah. yeah. But it's just like, again, look at what Thomas Sankara did in Burkina Faso. Mm. I do not believe racial differences matter that much, if at all, if these programs work everywhere you try them. These mass literacy programs, the industrialization of the Soviet Union, the industrialization of China, mm. uh, the industrialization, of, or not industrialization, but the infrastructure building in Burkina Faso, all these different racial groups, all using not quite the same, but pretty much the same kind of program, and it all works. It all changes the situation. It, it massively increases literacy. And so, you know, it, it, it is just something where... Yeah, it bothers me because I do see this spreading, you know, especially now that Elon Musk took over Twitter. Yeah. You see a lot more of it than you, you used to. You do see a lot. It's much more normalized now, yeah. which is, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff I see. I go, I thought we were, like, past this. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, uh, so I do just think it is important to talk about, you know. There's a lot of Anthony Cumia-style tweeting, <laughs> not from not just from him, from other people. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, an actual government, state-led development in a non-corrupt government works. Mm -hmm. And it's worked basically every time it's ever been tried. Mm -hmm. And Sankara died with empty pockets. He mm -hmm. was not a corrupt guy. Mm -hmm. um, Do you ever hear that Patrice bit where he's talking about how, like, he, he doesn't want to deal with Africa? Because he's like, what am I going to do in Africa? Go, go fight a war with sweatpants and tuxedo shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's, it is funny, but that is definitely people's perception. Of All right. Oh, dude, I mean, I saw Book of Mormon for the third time but i saw it for the kid's birthday this week mm -hmm. and you know for, you forget that part of the storyline is they go to uganda and like part of the bit is oh my god look how fucking uncivilized this is and everybody has aids and, yeah you know again uganda's war torn and it's terrible but there was a few moments where i'm sitting there like damn you got to make some more jokes about like the western influence of all of this oh yeah as opposed to the jokes land on mormonism and hey don't like sure, preach sure. your lame religion and think you're saving people where yeah. it's like okay no the story is also uh very scary and deadly uh, -huh. uh i mean i know it's not their job to say that but yeah. it is odd yeah and a lot of like oh I, we're going to africa like you know making it not just a put like one place they're going to it's like the continent of africa right, is right, this you know right it's just odd yeah but so it's like aging differently that's <clears throat> Uh, Sankara's successor in his murderer, Blaise Campare, uh, he's, uh, as I mentioned, he rules until 2014. He has to flee to the Ivory Coast, ultimately, because he tries to change the uh, Constitution to stay in power another term, and then there's a mass popular uprising. He chases him out. He flees to the Ivory Coast, where he still is, I believe. In April 2022, he was convicted in, in absentia by a Burkina Faso military court and sentenced to life in prison for his role in the murder of Sankara, but he's, uh, through his lawyers, he said he'll not He's not going to go back to Burkina Faso and go to prison. He's going to, I believe, stay in Ivory Coast. Um, and the current president of uh, Burkina Faso is a 34-year-old captain named Abraham Torre, uh, who seized power, you know, like just one year older than uh, Sankara was. Uh, they were both captains in the military. And, of course, they both wear the red beret, so there's heavy inspiration. Um, but I just thought it was interesting, like, right now, Burkina Faso, partly why Burkina Faso has had another period of a bunch of coups, and partly why that is, is because they've been dealing with, as well as, like, a lot of Africa's been dealing with very serious Al-Qaeda and ISIS-affiliated insurgencies, mm. and I found this thing from the BBC that I thought was interesting, where, um, not the only factor in that, but a big factor in that was the NATO overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, and uh, the BBC says, quote, not only it, uh, it not only released thousands of tons of weapons and explosives from government armories, Libyan government armories, much of it w uh, making its way across the southern borders into Sahel countries, Sahel countries. It also allowed IS jihadists to gain a foothold in the east of Libya. So like all these weapons from the Libyan military just kind of flooded to anybody who could grab them. And a lot of these kind of Islamist insurgents they've been tearing apart Burkina Faso. Like, since 2015, there's been this insurgency that's killed at least 10,000 civilians in Burkina Faso, and it's forced 2 million uh, to be displaced. So it's really devastated them. And that's, like, this uh, new guy, Ibrahim Traore, however you pronounce his name. Yeah, Traore. Traore. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, but he's uh, one of his main priorities has been fighting the insurgency. That's that's kind of what they've been focusing on right now. And it, it is just another thing where it's like, this is Western. You can say it's deliberate. You can say it's unintended consequences. But this is Western destabilization. This is like, if we can put an Islamist insurgency in this country, we will make sure they can't develop, they can't build their own rail networks, they can't educate their people, they can't do all these things that Thomas Sankara wanted to do. So, you know, like my personal view is that this creation of instability is much more deliberate than people want to think or talk about. Mm -hmm. But even if you think it's all just unintended, it's like the West is ultimately behind a lot of this. I, I have a question. So, yeah, this uh, this new guy, Ibrahim, right? He's um, he's saying, like, he hasn't banned French, but it's no longer the official language. Right. He's, there's, like, a U.K. company that, own, that like, has to – basically owns most of their gold. You know, they sell it to this U.K. company for very cheap, and he's saying, you need to pay for it by your sta- – basically, like, if you want gold, but pay for it in your version of how much gold is worth, mm. um, which they're obviously not willing to do. But he's, like, making all – okay, he made a deal with uh, Putin for, like, a nuclear deal where they're going to have nuclear plants there. And you see, like, China, um, where the continent of Africa, it's like they triple what the U.S. is doing in terms of trade on the continent of Africa. And it's, and it's like triple in the billions, you know? Like, when you're tripling billions, that's fucking insane. That's a lot of money. Um, is that good faith, or do you think in 10 years this is um, China and Russia, Russia conquering Africa? Or is this awesome? Well, it's a good question. I mean, uh, like, yeah, as you mentioned, he actually kicked all the French forces out, the new president of Burkina Faso. Um, they'd been, you know, cooperating to fight the insurgency, and he expelled all the all the French forces. So I think it's something where they believe they can get a better deal with the Russians and the Chinese than they can with the French. And it's like, based on their history, I totally understand why they would think that. Um, but he's actually... To my knowledge, he's actually there was a lot of news reports about they were going to use Wagner Group, the Russian uh, uh, private military company. They were going to use the Wagner Group to fight the mercenaries, and he says, "No, we're going to fight them with our own forces." So I think he is. I mean, we'll see what happens, but for now, they're maintaining a kind of appropriate distance. But they are kind of looking towards Russia and China for friendship and uh, economic support because obviously the French uh, are not thrilled about having all their forces expelled from the country. Right. And again, what that does is it just makes certain Americans, especially like in the media, going, oh, look at these African countries being evil, getting along with Russia and China. Right. They think they're all Russian puppets. Or yeah. Damn. Well, should we finish this over on uh, Patreon? Yeah. yeah. Keep it going over on Patreon? Well, I think that's most of what we got about Thomas Sankara. Okay. Um, yeah. Any, I guess, lessons, legacies, le- things you took away from the documentary or just the man's life in general? Um, I just thought it was a good, a good, uh, roadmap of how to be a chill, cool guy. You know, you got, yeah, I think you, you know, you should be righteous in, in, in what you believe. And, um, as long as what you believe in is righteous yeah, and just also know that probably is going to give you like four years. Yeah. Even Jesus, right. His teachings, it only goes over like four years of his teachings. Oh yeah. And then he's killed. Right. And so, but Jesus was like hanging out with whores and, you know, yeah. He was friends with women. He wasn't trying to, you know, yeah, yeah. get something out of it. Tax collectors and stuff, right? Tax collectors? Yeah, isn't like Jesus' story, if you actually look at it, it's like he hangs out with all the worst members of society. Everyone that everybody hates in society, he has like a friend that is that. And so like people who collect Pedophiles. taxes. Pedophiles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like everybody hated them. And so he's like, well, I have a friend who is, you know, there's always a story of uh-huh. like, you think this guy sucks? Well, yeah. Jesus Played cards with him. Was it the worst okay. people or like the the most like downtrodden, the mo- like ostracized people? I think the most know. hated by society, and by so society, he's finding yeah. a way to you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jesus had a, had a friend who was a polyamorous Brooklyn podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we could see the Jesus in all polyamorous Brooklyn podcasts. Exactly. I'm actually smarter than Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I just think my stuff is like better. Um. Cool. All right. Well, that was fun. We'll see you over on Patreon. You know, we'll yeah. get into we'll get into all kinds of stuff over there. Maybe some personal stuff. Yeah, we'll have a um, sillier, less educational episode. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Sound off in the comments what you thought about this, uh, and patreon.com slash out for smokes if you want to hear some more. Five dollars a month. Yep. Thanks for listening. We'll see you there. I will be in uh, Sisyphus Brewing Company in Minneapolis this weekend. Uh, you can go to sisyphusbrewing.com to get your tickets. I will also be in Raleigh on Valentine's Day at Good Nights. I'll be at uh, the... Bring in um, your wife? What's that? You bring in your wife? I don't think so. Just a one-nighter. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be in uh, Zany's in Chicago uh, 
uh, March 3rd, and then March 9th, I'll be in Cincinnati. I don't know what the name of the venue is. Bomb, the venue is Bombs Away. Uh, Bombs Away Comedy. Johnny booked that one for me. So Bombs Away Comedy in Cincinnati on March 9th. I would love to see you guys out on the road. Come and say hi. I'm I'm pretty accessible. I'm usually the guy drinking before the uh, before the show. Mike's a very friendly guy. Yeah. Um, so see you out there. Uh, any any other plugs? Follow us all on Instagram, Out yeah. for Smokes Pod. Sean P. McCarthy. Substack. Sean P. McCarthy. Substack. Com. Patreon, Mike Racine Comedy on Instagram, and we will see you next week. Bye bye.